Amen. He's worthy. He's worthy of all praise, honor, and glory. And Father, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for each person who chose to come out, Lord God, even in the midst of the rain and the new coldness that has hit the air. And Father God, we thank you, Lord God, that Holy Spirit will use my words to open our eyes and open our hearts to receive what you are bringing to us tonight, Lord God, that we would be transformed. Father, I thank you again and praise you for each person here. And we bless this time. We call it holy in your name. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Oh, I just want to say it's a privilege and an honor to stand before you. Um, this subject of possessing your vessel, I don't know if there is a more important word uh, or, or uh, assignment for us to possess our vessels. You know, sometimes your vessel can just get totally out of control and you're like, oh my God, is that me? And anyway, it's line upon line. Line upon line. You don't get it all at once. I'm, I, don't, I don't know how many times I've been through these classes, but each time I seem to have my eyes open to more and more that the Lord is doing in my heart and how he's healing me. So um, the topic tonight is bitter root judgments and inner vows. And Hebrews 12:15 uh, talks about uh, do not defile with with bitter roots, and so I I have this heading here that says bitter roots may be the most powerful force in our lives, bringing destruction to us and those around us. So it, these these uh, the subject bitter roots and what they are doesn't just defile us, it defiles people around us. So Hebrews 12, 15 reads, See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many become defiled, tainted, or polluted. The voice reads, watch carefully that no one falls short of God's favor, that no well of bitterness springs up. You know, we, call, we sing that song, spring up a well, but we're, we're talking about a great, good, God-filled well. But this is a well of bitterness. Make sure that it doesn't spring up to trouble you and throw many others off their path. A root is a practiced, hidden, and automatic way of drinking nurture from God, others, and ourselves. If we are rooted in Christ, we drink nourishment from God and his creation. If we have bitter roots, we produce bitter fruit harming ourselves and defiling others. So what are bitter roots or bitter root judgments? What, what is that? I mean, just the word bitter, you know it's not something good, right? So bitter roots are our sinful reactions to hurt. How many in here have never been hurt? <laughs> right. <laughs> Our sinful reactions to hurt. Someone may say something to you and you're like, oh my God, they're trying to hurt my feelings or something. And you don't take it very well. And you don't say, I forgive you. You just take it inside and it festers and grows. And that hurt, that's, that's how bitter roots are formed from that's the soil I'll say of a bitter root is hurt number two our critical condemning judgments of people usually our parents 
So when we are little, it's like our parents have full control over our lives. And they may not be really great parents. They may be parents that you feel want to control you. And so they may say something to you where you don't like and you may not be wanting to obey. And then the voice gets stronger and stronger. And next thing you know, you're weeping and crying. And next thing you know, they are popping you, you know, on your behind. And you could think that they are just treating you bad. But they are wanting you to be obedient to what they've said, right? So that you could internalize that and think, my mom is really trying to control me. Now, as a little child, you're not thinking, you know, control the way we think as adults somebody's con trying to control you. The child just know I'm hurt and internalize it and begin to think negative thoughts about usually it's usually the mother, but it very well could be father. The third thing is our... Uh, uh, how bitter roots are formed, our refusal and inability to forgive. Our refusal and inability to forgive. Uh, this verse in Hebrews, Hebrews 12, 15 says in the voice, watch carefully that no one falls short of God's favor, that no well of bitterness springs up to trouble you and throw many other people off the path. So if you have friendships, and all friendships have some kind of little friction, right? If you have, no, Cindy and I don't ever have any friction. <laughs> but if you're honest, there's times when your friends say things that you don't really like. And if you don't say something to them, and just internalize it and begin it to fester inside, it can grow into a bitter root. And you begin to act differently toward your friend. And they'll say, what is the matter? What happened? What's the matter? Nothing. Oh, something is happening. What's the matter? Oh, nothing. And you just keep going on like that. And the person, your friend, thinks... You know, everything is okay. Did I do something? But the, but the other person is keep saying nothing. In order for it to be dealt with, you need to re, re, uh, need to expose what's going on in your heart. There was hurt. Whatever was said, intentionally or unintentionally, it hurt your heart, and and it needs to be dealt with, or it will grow into something. That something that you're not going to like. It could grow into a real bitter root. Matthew 7 verses 1 and 2 says, Do not judge others, and you will not be judged, for you will be treated as you treat others. For God will judge you as you judge others. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. The measure you give will be the measure you get back. The power of bitter roots comes from the unchangeable law of God, which caused us to reap in kind what we have sown. Galatians 6, 7 says, don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. I'll read that again. Don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God when he say you reap what you sow. You cannot mock that. You will always harvest what you plant. We reap what we sow, not what they sow. It's like, uh, I think it was Joyce Myers that says, uh, 
you, you're drinking poison, but you're expecting the other person to die. That's what this is like. We reap what we sow, not what they sow. So Galatians again, 6 and 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a person sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will reap destruction from the flesh. But the one who sows to the Spirit will reap eternal life from the Spirit. Bitter roots contain the power to defile many, including ourselves, causing us to drink poison instead of nourishment. Romans, 1, Romans 2, 1 and 2 says, So we can see there are no excuses for any of us. If your eyes shift their focus from yourself to others to judge how they are doing, you have already condemned yourselves. You don't realize that you are pointing your fingers at others for the exact things you do as well. There's no doubt that judgment of God will justly fall upon hypocrites who practice such things. And this is saying, you know, there, there's a judging where you judge something as real or if it's true, you know. But this kind of judgment we're talking about is a condemnation that a person has towards someone's behavior or their looks or how they act. Um, you're judging. You, you're, you're saying, you know, whatever you're doing, I may be doing differently and better. Not always, but, you, but you're not appreciating who the other person is. You are judging them, condemning them, the word says. Bitter roots are not the hurtful or terrible things that happen to us. It's not the sins of those who have wronged us. They, they are sins, but our bitter roots are not what others have done to us. They are, the bitter roots are not powerful enough to overcome the free will of another person. Though they defile the person, bitter roots are not strong enough to overrule another person's behavior or their free will. So, we see what bitter roots are. What do, we, what do we do? How do we treat them? Healing for bitter root judgments. Bitter roots not brought to the cross defile others. So how are they formed? They are formed from a hurt that has come into our heart. And we've made some decision based on how that hurt came in. Could be a parent, could be a friend, could be a neighbor, could be a pastor. <laughs> anyway, how do we deal with them? Number one, there has to be a recognition, seeing sinful patterns and how they affect one's life. For an example, if, if, if I'm always basically getting hurt by uh, someone not sharing information or something like that with me, but they share it with everyone else, my heart could get hurt and I could judge the person who was not sharing. So instead of me going to the person, I start talking about the person to someone else. That talking to someone else is the defiling part. You're defiling the person that you're sharing information with. But you're recognizing, you need to recognize the sin 
of sharing that information and your behavior in doing so. Recognition is the first step. Seeing sinful patterns and how they affect one's life. Luke 6, 43 and 44 reads, A tree is known by its fruit. For a good tree does not bear bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. And we've heard this. We've heard this scripture probably a long time if you've been saved a while. A good tree does not bear bad fruit. A bad tree does not bear good fruit. For every tree is known by its fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they gather grapes from a bramble bush. Now, why is it saying that? If we are defiling others with gossip or, or behavior that's hurtful, then we are bearing bad fruit. If it's a pattern in relationships, then that's a recognition. Hopefully you're recognizing something is kind of not right here. The next step in dealing with a healing for bitter root judgments is repentance. Choosing to change, determining to stop patterns by acknowledging judgments and bring them and their expectations to death on the cross. Jesus bore all of our sin and therefore we can repent, ask for forgiveness and, and, and learn how to uh, remove the bitter roots. The next step is confession that allows us to be fully known before God in our brokenness and sin so that he can heal and change us. If it was in relationships that we were wounded, it will be in relationship that God designs for us to be healed. If it were in relationship, that means you weren't the Lone Ranger. You weren't out in the forest by yourself. So if you see these things, you're not going to be healed all by yourself. There has to be some recognition. There has to be some exposure of the behavior um, and, and uh, a, a will to seek healing. By addressing the root system in our lives, we can take stock of the nurture that we have been drawing from. For an example, when people wanting ministry come with marriage problems, it is almost always 50-50, but you probably wouldn't hear that from e either mate. It's him or it's her, but it's usually 50-50. A wife will most likely do to her husband that for which he, he bitterly judged his mother for. And the wife will most likely reap through her husband the very thing she judged her father for. I'm going to give you an example a little bit later here. It is painful when a couple begins to discover hidden things about one another. Many conclude they've made a mistake and married the wrong person. But God did not design, I thought this was really funny. God did not design our mates to make us comfortable. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I thought, I said, really? <laughs> you, you wouldn't be able to tell most people that. Because people think that they get married to be comfortable and happy ever after. But soon as you get married, a dynamic sets in place. If you, if you, if you judged your father for the way he treated your mother, then you will be um, bringing that into the marriage. And now you are the wife and your husband is like, the position of your father he's the husband let me continue with this so you can get it <laughs> uh, 
This is, this, this is not easy, let me tell you. The concepts are so different from what we know as people. When I first went to possessing your vessel, it was called Elijah House, and I'm like, what? R really? Oh my God, I don't think I'm gonna ever get this. And I had a session with Pastor Peter, and I said, Pastor Peter, who am I gonna be when I finish with this? <laughs> He said, you're going to be who God created you to be. So, um, but God did not design our mates to make us comfortable. Rather, we tend to marry someone designed, now I'm speaking, this is, this is the Sanfords talking, designed to grind as iron sharpens iron. Someone who triggers whatever we have stored in our hearts as children against our father who was the husband and mother who was the wife. As we take our sins to the cross, we can enter into blessed relationship with our mates and others, fulfilling God's will for, what did David say earlier? Transformation in our lives. So most of this material is coming from John and Paula Sanford. Uh, the book is Transformation of the Inner Man. So I'm going to read this um, story, I'll just call it a story, of Bert and Martha, that the Sanfords ministered to them, and it is contained in the book, Transformation of the Inner Man. So, John says, I'll give you a story. I'll give you a story that John and Paula Sanford used about a husband and a wife to illustrate how bitter root judgments form in our hearts and how they manifest bad fruit in our relationships, especially marriages. The names have been changed from the real couple that received ministry. These are new names. Through this story, Bert and Martha, through this story, Bert and Martha, John writes, Bert and Martha came to us for ministry, they said. Bert thought the problem was pure and simple. Martha was too fat and he couldn't stand it. Martha felt awful about herself but claimed it wouldn't be so hard to get the fat off if Bert would just quit criticizing her all the time. A few minutes of questioning revealed some root causes. Bert had grown up with a mom who not only became obese, but was also messy and dirty. She failed to care for her appearance. Now, this is Bert's mother. The house was poorly kept, and she'd used the bathroom with the door open and the children running in and out. Bert judged his mother for her appearance and her habits. His bitter root judgment and consequent expectancy was that his wife would become obese and messy like his mother. Martha had grown up with a father whom she could never please no matter how much she tried. Her father always found something to criticize. At least that was her perception. Whether her father was actually that critical was not what was important. As a prayer minister, what was critical or crucial was that she had judged her father. Since she could not honor her father in that area of life, it would not go well with her. That's Exodus 20, verse 12. Um, one of the Ten Commandments, honor your father and mother that life may go well with you. Her bitter root judgment and expectancy was that the man of her life would always be critical of her uh, and never be acceptable or be able to please her man. When Bert and Martha met, Martha was slim and a beautiful girl. They fell in love and married. Later, Martha became pregnant as she grew in size. So Bert, so Bert so did Bert's difficulty appreciating and complimenting her. Are you following me? Okay, thank you. After delivery of the baby, it took a while for her to lose weight. Bert became increasingly upset and critical. 
Bert was now sure that he had married someone just like his mother, though he couldn't have consciously admitted that. He found himself increasingly critical of her, of, of Martha, and scolding. But that was, of course, exactly what Martha was already expecting would happen because that's what she had received from her father. Under attack, she became agitated and insecure. So she ate more for comfort and grew heavier. As Bert became angrier and more critical, Martha became more upset and more nervous. The more he got upset, the more she ate. The more she ate, the more she got upset. No, the more she ate, the more he got upset. All of this affected their ability to keep, all of this affected her ability to keep herself and the house neat. You see where this is going? The judgments and reactions spun to more and more painful levels until at last she was living with an angry demon and he was living with an overweight wife. What created such a destructive spiral? It was not merely psychological expectancy. It's true that he expected his wife to become heavy and she expected to be criticized by her husband. But psychological expectancy by itself lacks sufficient power to have overcome their determination to lose weight or stop criticizing. So they had reached a standoff. As a couple, they knew things were going wrong, but they didn't have the power to change. Nothing was working. They saw what they were doing to each other, so they came to John and Paula Sanford for prayer ministry. Being Holy Spirit-filled Christians, this is Bert and, Ma Bert and Martha, they were Spirit-filled Christians. They had set their wills to quit, but they came to to the Sanfords for ministry because they found themselves powerless to stop. They knew they needed help. The law of judgment does have that kind of power over a person's will, over their mind. When Bert judged his mother, the law that declares that the measure he meets out he must receive went into effect when the judgment dishonored his mother regardless of whether she merited the judgment and even if the judgment was true that meant that Exodus chapter 20 verse 12 ensured that life would not go well with him most convincingly his judgment was a seed sown that by law had some day to be reaped. Are, are you following me? Just a tiny mustard seed grows to produce a large tree. So a seed of judgment sown increases the longer it remains unrecognized and unrepented of. These laws, let me just finish this. So we sow a tiny judgment and reap again and again, larger and larger in life. Every time we do a deed or hold a judgment in the heart that has not been repented or asked forgiven, forgiveness for, that can be compared to throwing a ball against the wall. Now, I think you have the handout where a man has, is throwing, these, uh, throwing a ball. It's a demonstration of this law of this phenomenon. Every time we do a deed or hold the judgment in the heart, that can be compared to throwing a ball against the wall. If a, a physicist knows the weight and the size of the ball and the distance to the wall and how much hurling power uh, he would, can predict when and with what momentum that ball will return. So on the handout, You have the handout? You see this, this man? Just say this ball is the bitter root judgment. He's throwing this ball. Um, 
and this is the principle of sowing and reaping. There are three laws that bitter root judgments and inner vows come under. Honor father and mother, sowing and reaping, and judge not, lest you be judged. So it says mankind sinning is like a man who throws a ball against the wall. At some point it will return to him. And this uh, is from Galatians 6, 7. So this young Joe throws the ball and you see all these years pass and now 25 years later. See how big this ball is? That's, that's how big that, say, the, bit, the bitter root judgment is and it definitely will impact your life. If it's not repented of and you're not asking for forgiveness, it will impact your life. It's the law of sowing and reaping. So, uh, the next paragraph says, God, unwilling that any should perish, sent Jesus to identify with us in all of our sinfulness. Jesus took our sin upon himself and died with it for us. Our sin was canceled and the law of sowing and reaping fulfilled in him. So, we say that this man, Joe, is a repentant Joe. He has accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, and the cross is, his, uh, is, is blocking that, that fruit from that bitter root judgment. So you can see this ball is huge. You can say this bitter root judgment is huge, but it's not giving him what it could because of the cross of Jesus. And that this, this repentant Joe has asked forgiveness, repented of his sin, and is not reaping what he sowed. <clears throat> so, um, natural laws, natural, with natural laws, we can comprehend that easily enough but God has not made one law for the natural and another for spiritual. All things are governed by the same basic laws. The law expressed in physics is for every action there must be an equal or opposite reaction. In chemistry, it's expressed as every equation or formula must balance. In our moral and spiritual life, it's Galatians 6, 7. Whatsoever a man sows, that is what he will reap. And in Matthew 7, 1, it's this, the law is judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. With the measure you meet, it shall be measured back to you again. All things will come to resolution and balance. That's God's justice. It's one basic law described. In each field, the law of sowing and reaping, however, adds another whole dimension. We don't sow one seed and get back one seed. All things increase in God's kingdom. God desires increase. So when we have this hurt from our childhoods, mostly that's Mostly, that's how it comes in. We forget that it's there. But after a while, we begin to see patterns. Uh, it could be um, having like fits of anger as a child. That your mother probably gave you a reprimand and said, get yourself together. However... You might have said under your breath, <laughs> this is really smart, Alecky, you get yourself together. <laughs> under the breath, uh, out loud, he's probably picking himself up from across the room. <laughs> but but that's, like, that's like, you know, um, the response to hurt. What if you have a mom who... Your friends come over, and she wants to sit down with you and your friends and watch television. You would want to say, Mom, could we have some space? 
and she might embarrass you somehow in the presence of your friends. That would hurt your heart. No one wants to be embarrassed in, in the presence of their friends. So then you have that, that hurt locked up in there, and then you may think, oh, my mom is just really controlling. She's she just controlling. She wants to control me. She wants to control my friends. That's a judgment. And it could lodge in your heart. And, and as a young man, you may think all women want to control, just like my mother. And, and you grow up and you think, you know, you're okay. But then like Bert and, and Martha, you get married and the stuff comes to the surface. Because uh, what we say, Cindy, what we say? The conditions have to be right, R-I-P-E. And when they are right, the conditions, you will get fruit. So with Bert and Martha, the conditions became right when they became husband and wife. Martha had judged her dad, so she was going to reap from her husband. Bert had judged his mom, and he was going to reap from his wife. And boy, did they reap from each other, right? So what pattern or patterns can you identify as being like your family of origin, especially your mother and father? And generally, it's not the positive things. It, it would be wonderful if it was all positive things. But just think about some of the negative things that you saw in your family uh, growing up. Is your partner anything like your father? Or is your partner... Uh, if it's a man, is it anything like your mother? Is your relationship similar in any way to the relationship you experienced between your mother and father? <clears throat> mother and father could have been one of those couples that argued all the time. And the child might have said in his heart, if that's what marriage is like, I I'm never going to get married. I'm never going to get married. That's an inner vow. You judged your parents, and then you gave this inner vow, I'm never going to get married. Um, I'm never going to get married. And so every female probably that he come across who might want to be married to him, he's, he's, it, he's incapable, really, spiritually, of receiving a, a, a wife. Because he's made that. And inner vows are strong. Okay, number four. Do you remember having any judgments about how your father treated you? Or your mother treated you? Negative. We're, we're trying to bring out the negative so we can get rid of it, right? Right. Was your father affectionate? Did your, did your uh, father give you attention? Hebrews 12, 15, again, is the, is the scripture that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble. And by it, many become defiled, tainted, or polluted. Ephesians 4 says, 431, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice, with all malice. So, if you don't deal with bitterness, that bitterness will progress toward extreme anger. That it, this is, is deciphering this scripture in, he, in Ephesians 4.31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with malice. So if we don't deal with bitterness, that bitterness will progress toward extreme anger. If we don't deal with the anger, we will start to clamor and demand what we want. If that doesn't work, we will start to talk bad about the object of our bitterness and the hopes of recruiting others to agree with and justify our feelings. That's slander. 
and defilement. If that's unchecked, we will eventually have a desire to cause harm to the person we are bitter toward. All along the way, people are hurt, relationships are derailed, joy is stolen, and growth of the fruit of the Spirit is stunted. The fruit of the Spirit is stifled from growing in a heart full of bitter root judgments. Okay, let's look at um, Okay, I'll keep going here. Proverbs 20:25 20, says, "It is a snare for a man to devote rashly something as holy and afterward could, and afterward to reconsider his vows." And this is talking about vowing something to the Lord uh, and then not, not fulfilling the vow. That's not what we call inner vows. Inner vows are made in response to judgments that we have lodged in our hearts. How, um, inner, inner free, let me just read this because I thought it was really good. By the gift of free will, God made us sovereign over our own hearts. This allows us to live in inner freedom, even under conditions of outward bondage. And the example they gave was Paul and Silas. Paul and Silas had inner freedom, but they were in an outward bondage in the prison. He said, it also, however, uh, it also creates the possibility that we will live with inner bondage. These inner vows will cause us to live with inner bondage even under conditions of outward freedom. Opposite of Paul and Silas. When we have these bitter root judgments and anger and sharpness about our tongue, we have inner bondage though we are free to be who we need to be outside outside of ourselves in our environments sometimes it is not the choices we make in the present that limit our freedom but ones we have rashly made in the past now I'm going to read this in invasion of innocence because Sometimes when we are children, um, the enemy of our souls comes and hijacks us. It's called invasion of innocence. We have been given free will in a world in which an invisible enemy has been at work to ensnare us as captives to his will. 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 26 read, The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, skillful in teaching, patient when wronged, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition. If perhaps God may grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. One of the ways... The evil one ensnares us is by an invasion of innocence. When hurt or injustice happens to us as children, if we were left uncovered by a, an adult or, or someone who were able to guide our heart through truth, we may have been led astray in our innocence and ignorance of God's ways into making inner vows. Do you understand that point? These inner vows suggest to us by temptation. Therefore, many people have gone into captivity, like it says about uh, the people of Israel in Isaiah 5.13, because they have no knowledge of me, God says. 
And Hosea says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Without knowledge, we may also have formed bitter root judgments that caused us to make inner vows, thus placing our future in bondage and captivity to the past. It seems entirely unfair, and yet God has created us in his image as people of the word. We are people of the word, our words, and the agreement of our wills with the words have tremendous life-shaping power, whether we wish it were so or not. We are word people, and most of the time it's our words that cause us to be hijacked. Proverbs 18, 21 said, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. In a vows. Okay. Most of the vows are made in response to some hurt, as we said, that would cause us to have bitter roots. And then we then make an inner vow that says what we will or will not do. Inner vows are often made in response to our condemnation or judgment of others. Inner vows are misguided attempts to avoid repeating behaviors that we reject or dislike in others. We see something we don't like, right? We, we, we uh, make uh, uh, attempts to, to not do that ourselves. What that does, it causes us to, in response to the, in a, in a response to the bitter root judgment, the bitter root judgment could be, my mother is very partial she treats my older brother better than me me could be a, another brother or a sister right so anyway the, the 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 child is saying my mother is um what did i say partial thank you she has favorites and we see that in families right so your inner vow could be, when I become a parent, a parent, I will never show favoritism to my children, right? So, you know what that does? It, it causes the person to do exactly what they said they would not do. So here are some inner vows. You have that paper too also, I think. They, the, the inner vows are I will never or I will always. I will never let anyone love me. Why would you think someone would, would not want anyone to love them? Because maybe the love that they saw was smothering. Maybe it was um, controlling. Maybe it was, I want all of you and nobody else is going to have any of you kind of attitude. I would never let anyone love me. I would never be weak. I would never trust anyone. I would never allow myself to need all of these sound sinful, right? I will never let them take anything away from me. I will never allow anyone to touch me. I will never share what is mine. And you can read these for yourself, but let's get down to the I will always. And so you see this prisoner, this, this man, he's in jail and he's been in there a long time. Inner vows imprison us to think and act as they have set the mold. I will never or I will always. We cannot always do anything. Like some people would say, I, I will always uh, love my children. You will always love your children. 
but maybe there's something in that always that's causing your children to be smothered and not have their own mind or their own thinking or be able to make their own decisions. So this, I will always remain aloof, separate. I will always be logical. I will always be in control of my life. Well, really? <laughs> that's, that's like, whoa. Okay. I'm going to read another um, example from the, from the Sanfords of how powerful bitter root judgments and inner vows are. Okay, this is a woman, they said, that came to them who could not bear a male child. Several times she had become pregnant and had miscarried. Several times she had become pregnant and miscarried boys about the third or fourth month. Gynecologists could find no physical cause. She wanted fervently to give her husband a son. We asked concerning her life with her father and could find some hurts, but her reactions did not seem great enough to create such a destructive, obviously psychosomatic condition of not being able to carry a boy child. Her brother, however, was not like the usual sibling who teases because he loves. This brother was vicious, continually embarrassing and physically hurting his sister. Her father failed to protect her. She remembered then at about nine or 10, she remembered after being with the Sanfords, she remembered being about nine or 10, walking beside a river, picking up stones, hurling them into the water, crying out, I'll never carry a boy child. I'll never carry a boy child. That was an inner vow, a directive sent through the heart and mind to the body. Though the conscious mind had long forgotten the inner being as the, mm, though the conscious mind had long forgotten, the inner being had not. Though she now wanted to give birth, the earlier programming was still intact and functioning. So the Sanfords took up authority in Christ, knowing that whatever we loose is loosed, having pronounced forgiveness for her hatred of her brother and induced her to forgive, the Sanfords spoke directly to her body, even as Jesus rebuked the fever over the um, uh, I think it was uh, Peter's mother. But anyway, they commanded the body to forget that hateful order and to return to the original command of God to subdue and fill the earth. Mentioning subdue was a polite way of reminding the body as part of nature to obey the voice of the Lord even as Jesus commanded the waves and the winds and they obeyed him. We prayed comfort and healing for her heart and spirit and for her body. In the prayer, we visualized her being able to produce a healthy, normal baby boy. She did conceive and carry to full term a normal, healthy son. That's the power of that bitter root judgment and inner vow. But she really hated her brother because he was vicious. And if having somebody like him as her son, she, she didn't want that. So, traits of inner vows. They are common to every individual. They are powerful. Vows made as an adult lack the controlling power of vows made in childhood. They are difficult to identify, often hidden in our inner being. They refuse change. They don't disappear during maturation process. 
like if they came in, made these anavows when they were children, right? They don't disappear as a person matures. They persist in producing negative fruit even after the judgments are healed, supported by strong structures built around them. When we judge another and vow not to do what they did, the vow often works in reverse. We condemn ourselves. Romans 2, 1. In a vows can be a way of trying to break generational patterns or correct our behavior in our own strength. But the bitter root judgment binds us to the pattern. And the vow inadvertently puts all the burden of transformation on self instead of upon the Lord and therefore blocks the one who vowed from being able to receive God's help, God's grace to remove the, the, the fruit of the inner vow. Inner vows like outer vows are very binding as the scriptures reveal. When you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay to pay it. For the Lord your God will surely require it of you, and it would be sin to you not to uh, pay the vow. And one of the fascinating parts of scripture to me was this man Jephthah. He was a king from the book of Judges, 11 verse 30 to 35. He went to war and he asked the Lord to help him win the war. And he said to the Lord, I think he said whatever. I don't think he said whoever. Whatever comes out of my door when I get home, the first thing that comes out of my door when I get home, I will give that to you, Lord, as a sacrifice. And it was his daughter. And he kept his vow. It, you can read it. It's, it's Judges 11, uh, verses 30 through 35. The, the, the dialogue goes further than verse 35. But his daughter is what came out of the door. The first thing that came out of the door. And he kept his vow and sacrificed her to the Lord. Deuteronomy 23, 21 uh, through 23 says, but if you abstain from vowing, it shall not be sin to you. So don't vow. That which has gone from your lips you shall keep and perform. For you voluntarily vowed to the Lord your God what you have promised with your mouth. The way of escape. Fortunately, the Lord our father and husband has preserved a way to annul our rash vows prompted by the enemy's deception by bringing them to him. If we are willing to repent of any bitter root judgments that may have prompted us to make the rash vows in the first place, forgiven all concerned and given the situation entirely to the Lord for him to redeem, then we can with confidence repent and renounce the inner vow and command it to be broken off of our lives. Hallelujah. Thank God. <laughs> Thank God. Thank God. Discernment and recollection are needed. The only difficult part to breaking inner vows is realizing where we have made them. So we ask the Lord for discernment and recollection. Discernment because there are vows that we may have made as free will offerings to him. These we would be wise to keep. If we vow to the Lord, I'm going to do X amount in the fund drive or whatever that may be. You, you need to keep that vow. But recollection because we have to be able to remember because there may be other vows that the enemy used to bring us into agreement with his plans for our life that have been hidden by him in our forgetfulness. These the father disallows if we renounce them. So 
I'm just going to go through this handout that says removal of bitter root judgments and inner vows. And um, then th this is the close uh, of the teaching, okay? Removal of bitter root judgments and inner vows. Number one, when we are ministering to someone, we want to hear their childhood history and kind of the history of the family. And while we are listening to the history, we hear um, places where hurt has come in and we uh, walk the person through forgiving whoever hurt them, probably mother or father, maybe siblings, forgive them for the hurt. Um, here I have an example. Mom favored my younger sibling. This always hurt me. So the judgment could be of mom. My mom is partial. She, she, she doesn't treat us equal. Um, so we, we ask God to forgive for judging the person. Uh, Father, forgive me for judging my mom as partial. And then we break the power of the judgments. Ask God to forgive us for judging. And then we break the power of the judgments off of their life. Um, and then we ask the Lord to cleanse all who were defiled. Because bitter root judgments defile. Somebody's hearing what you're saying about somebody. Or your attitude or the way you act toward the person reveals that there's some ick going on. So um, we break the power of the judgments. We ask Father to cleanse the person who has been defiled, wash them in the blood of Jesus uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, rid of the judgments, the bitter root judgments. And then we renounce the inner vow that the inner vow here, like related to mom, could be I would never be partial and treat one of my children differently than the others. I renounce that inner vow. I would never be like my mother. I'll never show favorites like mom. I'll never embarrass my child in public like mom did me. We renounce those inner vows. And then if there seems to be an ungodly soul tie between the child and mom, we break the ungodly soul tie and bless the relationship. So that's kind of the process. I, I added this prayer to remove word curses because we've all heard them. You can just pray this prayer right down the line to remove any word curses. And if there are some that are not on this list, include them before you get to I remove any other curse. So, that's the end of the teaching. <laughs> We're going to open up for questions. Yeah. And come up. You can come up. In there. Yep. That was great. Thank you. So you, you said that sometimes it's really hard to identify an inner vow that somebody made and then forgot. So when you talk to somebody and they can't remember, what, what can you do? Do you ask the spirit to reveal it to you? Or how do you get to a vow that was made as childhood let's say okay it we go by the judgment they've they've said to us what what the parent did they've said to us what the parent did and so from that what the parent did they judged the parent by their behavior and and it's just automatic like I would never be like my mom I would never or I would always protect my children. So, so the judgment, once, once you've forgiven the parent or whoever committed the, um, 
the act toward the person to hurt their heart. The person made a judgment against the person, so you, the person asked God to forgive them for judging. The Bible said, judge not lest you be judged. And then we break the power of those judgments off of their life. And then we renounce any inner vow. I mean, the inner vow, you won't come up. The inner vow is like, um, it just automatically follows the judgment. So, yeah, it's, it's an automatic response to the judgment, right? And, you know, we have some inner vows that say, I would never embarrass my child like my mom embarrassed me. That, that may seem like a really good thing, right? I mean, who here has questioned that? Well, that's, that's a really good thing to say, right? I, I wouldn't want to embarrass my child. So why is that wrong? Why, well, I, I'm sure you guys have asked that question, right? Well, because that inner vow came from a bitter root judgment. And what does Hebrews 12.5 say? If you could put that up there, Hebrews 12.5. The root of it is from a bitter root, and there comes defilement from that. So then the spiritual law from that inner vow, that may seem good, right, that I will never embarrass my child, there will come defilement from that. Because that's There the will law. come an embarrassment to the child. Right. It will manifest it in will, a way. It will manifest. Yeah. Any other questions? Asia, can, I just, can I just add to that? So, Ron, what I think what I heard you saying is, like, how do you figure that out? I think what you do is you look at the fruit. Like, you examine the fruit. And sometimes when you, like, you, you can't figure it out, but when we're sitting there, like Easter said before, we ask a lot of questions, and we start to see fruit. And from that fruit, we can usually tell what the judgment is. There's a root. Where there's fruit, there's a root. And so you just trace it back. You're always tracing it back to the, to the fruit. And that's where you say, you, you know, you just come up with, oh, yeah, that's it. And then it usually triggers what you might have said as a kid. And sometimes people will say, well, I don't remember saying that. But you say it when you're a kid, and the fruit is there, so that's how you know that you probably said it in some form or another. Just an example, just a quick example of a unga an ungodly soul tie with mother. Because we're just going through the prayer right now, and that kind of popped to me. So what would that look like to have an ungodly soul tie with mom, for example? An ungodly soul tie, like if, if it's a male... Oh, it could be a female. Mom has to be involved in everything. The child cannot think for themselves. Even though they're married, they go to mom to get her approval for this, that, and the other. And there's always this rancor kind of between them. What soul ties do, what they do is control, basically. They control a person's life and if it's unhealthy if the relationship crosses an unhealthy boundary line where it becomes unhealthy with a parent where there's like a codependency or there's too much involvement like Easter just said that's when you you would say that the person has an ungodly soul tie because you can have a godly soul tie with your parent of course but when it becomes unhealthy for party, that's when it becomes an ungodly soul tie. Thank you, Easter, um, for going through this tonight. One of the th one of the thoughts that occurred to me as we're looking at our family of origin, that at the heart of this, and maybe you could just speak to this for a minute. At the heart of this is the commandment to honor our father and mother, and and the judgments and the inner vows dishonor and so that kind of creates that pattern as well yes as i said um early in the in the uh talk the three laws honor your father and your mother 
that it will go well with you and your days will be long on the earth. In the place where you don't honor your father and your mother, it's not going to go well. I don't, it's the law. It's a law. The other one is um, sowing and reaping. The dishonor to the parent, you will reap dishonor from your children. And this uh, judge not, lest you be judged. We judge our parents sometimes. And then we have children and they, they judge us. And so many times people make these inner vows thinking that they can cut something off in the bloodline. But it makes it worse. Hello. Hi. So I'm trying to make the difference between stating a fact versus a judgment. Like, like we read about Jacob, and we all know that he favored Joseph, right? That was kind of like a fact from what we see. So how And do his we... brothers and Joseph's brothers judge their father. But let's say as an adult, like we have a parent that we know has a favorite. Like, how, do we, how can you tell that we're either judging or just stating a fact? Yes, you know, she favors this child, and we're not really judging. <laughs> a lot of times it's the ick. I don't know how else to describe it. There's an ick. There's an there's a ick in the relationship. It, it's more than just a fact it has turned into something bitter. It's, w it's when the, of the offense settles in your heart, right? When the, when the unforgiveness, because this sibling is favored, that offense settles in your heart and then comes a judgment from the unforgiveness. Is so that, that's a normal human condition, right? As Easter always says, when we're ministering to somebody, it's really the attitude of your heart. So it's, you know, stating a fact or discerning something versus judging is a very fine line. And it's really about the attitude of your heart. So you could say, my mom favored my sister, and that's a fact. There's, you know, if we just, if I said to Easter, Easter, you know, my mom favored my sister. That's just a fact. But if I say, Easter, you would not believe my mom favors my sister. She does this for her. She does that for her. She's always doing this for her and that. Then it becomes an attitude of my heart that switches it from a judgment, a, a just, you know, just a fact to judging. So it's really a heart attitude. I was just going to say that sometimes it, it is important. <laughs> All right. I was going to say that sometimes it manifests as a hurt. Like the person might not think of it as an offense, like they're offended. They just feel hurt which is an offense, but it's just a different way of looking at it for certain personalities. So if you feel hurt by the partiality that a parent has towards a sibling, then there's probably a judgment there. Exactly right, yeah. That's really good, that's yeah. good. That's really good. Good? We're gonna use that On our website or applications for ministry. <laughs> I'm just saying. And there's just the one thing that I would add to it is that sometimes when um, People say, but I forgave, I forgave, I forgave. I don't understand why this is still happening in my life. We can forgive someone, but the law of sowing and reaping has to play out. So when we judge, if there's a judgment in place and you're finding that you did all the forgiveness you could do and you're still kind of stuck, a lot of times it's because there's a vow and judgment in place that have not been broken yet. Because it's just like gravity. I can say I, I don't want this to drop when I let go of it. But when I let go of it, it's going to drop. And it's the same thing with the law of sowing and reaping. We could say we don't want to reap or whatever, but we're going to. So sometimes when the forgiveness has been accomplished, but you're still stuck, it's usually that there's a vow and a judgment in place.
Oh, there are some applications in the back. You don't have to go on the website. <laughs> okay. Does this also pertain to a mother-in-law, even though they're not your, you know, she's not your mother? Does that pertain to a mother-in-law too? <laughs> we could be here all night about the mother-in-laws. What? What'd you say? We could be here all night with the mother-in-law. Uh, well, I just, I just wondered if you this have was, an example. Yeah, the one of my relationships. Um, instead, like we would have a conversation, but instead he would always go to her all the time, and then the bottom line would be with whatever she said. So I didn't like that, but I don't know if that was an attitude, a judgment. It's an ungodly soul time. With me? No, no. With, him? with his, with his mother. Oh. Well, with his we, mother. So you still? So what do I do with that? They're, they're in heaven. <laughs> I mean, it still affected me. The person Just has to, to the person has to want to be healed. The person has to want to be delivered. But they're in heaven. Oh, not well, alive anymore. So you're, you're still dealing with the issue? Yeah, I want to make sure I don't do that. So am, I have to just have the forgiving of that, or is that a judgment on my part? Both? Okay. You <laughs> want an appointment, Linda? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I get it. <laughs> Forgive, repent for the judgment, and any inner vow the Lord shows you, you break and cut cut that inner vow off. Yeah, yeah. One I could hear is I would never be a mother-in-law like my mother-in-law. So that that's the inner vow. So you've judged her for her behavior. And so we start at the beginning. Forgive her. Ask the Lord to forgive you for judging her and then renounce the inner vows. One more question related to that. So let's say if Linda said, I will never be a mother-in-law like my mother-in-law, could that translate to her children not being married? Girl. <laughs> <laughs> could that translate to her children not I <clears throat> I'm sure they have been defiled by the judgments but for it to go down in the in the bloodline I don't, I don't I'd have to think about that I don't know what do you think Cindy so it could, if, if the child then, sa if, say, Linda's child, we'll just use Linda because she brought it up, right? So if her, if her child observes what's going on with the mother-in-law and says, if that's what happens when you get married, that you have to have a mother-in-law like that, I don't want to get married. So it could, you know, trickle down, but by itself. It goes back to the whole bitter root defiling many, right? And so if, it, if you're living that bitter root out and it's manifesting down to your daughter, then it can have an effect on you, right? One more question. It's kind of along the same lines of what Linda just said. So if I get it right, she, you were judging your mother-in-law's relationship with your husband, how he was going to her a lot. So could that be a judgment against her husband that perpetuates in her life in some way? Yeah, she probably said he's a wimp. <laughs> he, he couldn't cut free from his mother. From his mother. Uh, it was an ungodly soul tie between the mother and the son. Hurt? I'm not hearing you. I'm sorry. 
it, the, does, it, does her judgment perpetuate that? Does, does it feed into it? Does, it? does it control the will of that relationship? Between the mother-in-law between, between and the mother and the son. Yeah. The, the relationship between the mother-in-law and her son has been going on since he was a little boy. So Linda coming into the picture probably just caught, stirred up a hornet's nest. I, I, the ungodly soul tie between the mom and the son is what needs to uh, be severed. But he's in heaven. So Linda, probably, you probably need to do some forgiveness and breaking judgments and in a vows that I would never be like her. Okay. Father, we come to you, Lord God, and we have in all that we've said, attempted to honor you as our Lord and Savior and have no other Lords before us. I thank you for this people, Lord God, that are so interested to know how to walk in freedom. And Father God, we thank you for how you have shed light on situations, even though everyone didn't talk about that situation. I know Holy Spirit enlightened two things that maybe need to uh, be, uh, be discerned and looked at closer. So we thank you, Holy Spirit, for how you're going to walk us, continue to walk with us to freedom. And we bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.